Good morning, everyone. Would everyone please stand for opening prayer this morning? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day, Lord, and we look forward to hear from you, Lord. As your word is being taught, just open it up to our hearts and minds by your spirit. And we also pray again for our worship, Lord. We want to honor you through these songs that we sing unto you. Thank you, Lord, for being our God. Thank you for your graciousness towards us. And Lord, may we serve you with faithful hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Today we're looking at Psalm 48. So if you want to turn there, Psalm 48. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. In the city of our God, in his holy mountain, beautiful in elevation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. God is in her palaces. He is known as her refuge. For behold, the kings assembled, they paused, they passed by together. They saw it, and so they marveled. They were troubled, they hastened away. Fear took hold of them there, and pain as of a woman in birth pangs. And when you break the ships of Tarsus, with an east wind. As we have heard, so we have seen. In the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God, God will establish it forever. Selah. We have thought of, O oh God, on your loving kindnesses in the midst of the temple. According to your name, O oh God, so is your praise to the ends of the earth. Your right hand is full of righteousness. Let Mount Zion rejoice. Let the daughters of Judah be glad because of your judgments. Walk about Zion and go all around her. Count her towers. Mark well her bulwarks. Consider her palaces that you may tell it to the generation following. For this is God, our God, forever and ever. He will be our guide, even to death. Uh, this morning, um, again, it's just uh, we're privileged to have uh, Tim Reed and his family here. Um, remember, uh, Tim Reed and his family um, were ministering in China. I can say that, right? Because I just did. So, yeah. <laughs> Anyway, when COVID came around, th everything changed. You know, it changed here in America, but it changed all over the world, too. And God brought him into the ministry in Thailand. And so uh, this morning, Tim is going to share a little bit about the work in Thailand and share out of uh, John chapter 9 also. So let's give uh, Tim and uh, Calvary Chapel welcome this morning. I'll go ahead and uh, ask my whole family to stand because, you know, we're, we're not celebrities. We're humble people. We don't want to be stared at, so just go ahead and look at us right now. <laughs> and the first thing you'll notice is some of us have grown this way and some of us are growing this way. But, um, but yeah, we've had a lot going on in the last two years, and uh, two of our older kids uh, went for believer's baptism in the last year at our Thai church. And so we've got a lot to celebrate. We've got a lot to thank you for. Um, it's, it's been a long journey. Uh, it was 2015 when we first, I think, came and presented and said, we'd like to go to China. And, uh, you know, you, you guys got behind us with that. And uh, eight years later, here we are. And now we've been in Thailand for two years. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but I'm an English teacher by trade. And, you know, as an English teacher, you, you got to have one point to the whole lesson. And so I want to ask myself, what are we doing here? Why are we here? And I think, it, I think it's always worth reminding ourselves. I like to know, why are we doing this? Why, why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? Why are, why are we preaching from the word? And the reason our family is here with you today is for one simple reason. We, we really believe and count it a pleasure and honor, a, an important part of our mission, to be partners with you. And as partners with you, I guess it's part of our job to just encourage you that God is alive and working in this world. So that's, that's why we're here, because we want to connect Calvary Chapel with what God's doing in Thailand, with what God has been doing in Southeast Asia for years. 
we, we only have a small little window into what he's doing, but that's what we want to share with you. So um, we'll, we'll go to the next slide. I put this one up for nostalgia's sake. That's, that's been the last you know, six years of our journey was in China. We shared with you how God is working uh, on college campuses. We were on the same campus for four years and continued. Even during COVID, we were teaching online and you, know, you probably saw a little bit more of us then. We were in the States. Uh, but then in 2022, we'll go to the next slide, that's when we moved to Chiang Mai, Thailand. So a lot is different. Uh, some things are the same. Um, but in Thailand, it's less than 1% Christian. But I want you to notice on the bottom there, they've, they've had the gospel for over 150 years. So there's, there's been missionaries and there's an established Thai church, uh, that one church in particular that we got to be a part of. Um, so they've had the gospel for this long, but it's still an unreached people group. Unreached. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm going to do a quick exercise here real quick. So we've got a group of, I don't know, would you say this is 40, 50 people? Okay, so if, um, if 10 of us stood up right now, that would be like a reached people group, right? Like Wisconsin, I, I, I bet there's 10% people that would say they're Christian. And so we could say that's, that's reached. Now, if only one person stood up out of this group, that would be an unreached people group. And then if nobody stood up, that would say that's unengaged. We, we need gospel people there. So, so Thailand, even though it's, it's had the gospel for, for so long, it's still an unreached people. Um, there, there are lots of Christians there, but many of the missionaries go to other places. They don't even reach the Thai. And so this has kind of been the journey that we're, we're getting into, um, exploring what it's like. We'll go to the next slide. So uh, this is just a snapshot of our, our church, Chain Mai Grace Church. Uh, Chain Mai is in northern Thailand, lots of mountains. We're kind of used to that. <laughs> Hot weather, we're used to that <laughs> by now. <laughs> uh, so anyway, this is Chain Mai Grace Church. And again, uh, just a special place. Um, the, the danger of showing cool pictures like this is you think that's every day and that's normal. For one, this, this is at a wedding, so we don't dress like that all the time. <laughs> but, but secondly, um, the average church in Thailand is about 20 to 30 people. And our church is kind of the exception because it's established, it's led by a Thai pastor, and we, we have anywhere from you know, 60 to 100 people on a given day. And so that, that's not normal in Thailand. Uh, it, it's a blessing to be part of that established church because then as we're kind of getting our feet wet, we, we are able to make more connections. But, but I just want you to know that the average church is, is quite small. Many of them don't have uh, pastors or regular teaching or they'll have teachers come and go. And so uh, all that to say, there's, there's a great need for church planting for pastors for teaching God's word in Thailand. We'll go to the next slide. So what have the last two years looked like for us? Well, I'll just give you a, a quick snapshot of what that looked like. Uh, again, being an English teacher in the past, that was a natural connection for me. So we got connected with a ministry called The Center, which was a campus outreach. Again, teaching English to Thai students that wanted to improve their English. <laughs> and uh, using that as a platform to share the gospel. So we would uh, invite the students to the center, uh, which was just a building close by campus, and we would have games and activities and food and share our testimonies with, with students. So one, one student in particular, uh, his name is Jojo. He's actually a teacher now. So he, he used to be a student, now he's a teacher. He teaches at an international school and we met actually at one of these universities. And he's like, hey, you're, you're American. I need to talk to you. I was like, oh, OK. So we talked, and he wanted to practice his English. And I said, hey, if you want to practice more, you could come to the center. We, we have many teachers from Australia and South Africa and, and all over. You could practice your English. So he did. He showed up. And here he is. He's a teacher, and he's with all these other university students. And he played the games, and he had fun. And, act like a crazy kid all over again. But he started to build relationships, and then we shared a Bible with him. And then he started to read it, and he read Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And he's like, boy, this is really good stuff. And then I invited him to our Thai church's uh, Christmas celebration. And I said, would you like to know what a Thai church looks like? 
because I bet you've never been to one. And sure enough, he hadn't. So he came and then he met our Thai pastor and then the relationship built. And then several weeks later, he professed Jesus and he prayed to accept Christ as his Lord. And so again, you know, kind of the same thing, different story, different channel, <laughs> but God, God can use relationships and things as simple as English. Um, so in the last two years, whether it was visiting orphanages or high schools like this or universities or campus outreach, a lot of opportunities. But uh, as we were sharing with you, our prayer request for the last two years has been, God, there, there's endless opportunity and there's endless need, but where would you have our family? What role, what, uh, what gifting have you given us that you want us to fulfill here in Thailand. So we'll go to the next slide. So I'm going to have uh, Katie come up and share a little bit because uh, to put things into context, for the last two years we, we did lots of different Thai ministry just kind of exploring. But one thing that stayed the same would be the, the, the Chinese immigrants that were coming to Thailand. So there's so many Chinese that come to Chiang Mai specifically for education or for different reasons. So I'm going to have Katie share and talk a little bit about our experience with that. So I want to thank you guys to help us to, you know, have a privilege to share God's word in another country. And I always tell people when God interrupts our plan and he's mean to humble us, you know, when we go to China, I have confidence, you know, because I speak Chinese, I know the culture very well, connect people very naturally. And when we go to Thailand, when we called to go to Thailand, I was terrified. I said, what am I going to do there? I don't know the culture. I don't know the language. You know, be, even before we get on the plane, I was praying. I said, God, is this really your will for me to go there? <laughs> just like, if not, just stop me, you know. But until the fl flight landed in Thailand, I was like, okay, this is God's will. I'm gonna, what I'm going to do there? You know, I'm a foreigner. <laughs> now I feel like a real missionary because I have to learn everything from the ground. But that's the time God humbles me personally, especially. <laughs> and uh, I have to focus on building a relationship with him for a long time, period of time. Because, you know, as a woman, we all know we are naturally insecure. <laughs> and I have a children, you try to raise them in a different country. And then God is really show me he is faithful. And uh, it's naturally, he not using our ability or talents. He used our weakness. You know, he's naturally connect me with a bunch of moms. You know, in China, if you know this background or culturally, you know, there's a, people are highly focused on education. So you heard about all those scary stories about Chinese education. They're they're not raising their children for, you know, because of, how to say this, put it this way, just worldly wisdom. They, are, they think they are raising their children, pursuing the higher education, but naturally they don't know God. They don't know how God designed the family and their children. They, are, you know, use the education to actually damage their children. So a lot of uh, people, if they have financially, um, uh, ably, the, there's a family will say, okay, moms take the children to Thailand because they have a cheaper education but an international education. You can get a, a, a how to say, international school for cheaper than sending your children to Chinese international school. So they make a sacrifice thinking, okay, the mom take the kids go to Thailand and dad stay in China to work and make money and then support their family pursuing higher education in Thailand. But COVID happened. So the China closed the border and the, the father cannot get out of the country and the mother cannot return. So they have to see each other like uh, three years until China eventually opened. You can see how mentally damaged those families and how broken the f marriage are, you know. So when, just that's how God brought us in this environment. And uh, when you are financially rich and you're spiritually broken, you have a hunger there because we know God designed as a spiritual being. So when we go, you know, when we go as a family and go there, and I have a, 
I have a friends, you know, the American couple, older, and they just like, we have this Chinese Bible study in our house, but the majority of people are, doesn't know the Ch- English very well. He said, would you like to join us, you know? So I went there just to have naturally connect with those moms, and uh, they could, uh, uh, you know, they hunger for God's word. And uh, when we have, when I go inside, just join the discussion and help them to understand more, then you can see the hunger. They eventually connect with them, and we give them a biblical marriage counseling, and also how you raise children, raise the, what the Bible talk about biblical way. So you can see the hunger. <laughs> you know, not why that we doing it. <laughs> it's like because the God naturally attract to those people who he already prepared for. So that's the kind of the relationship building. And uh, then, what else? We'll talk about Charles next. We'll go to the oh, next yeah. slide. yeah, <clears throat> okay. So how this lead to a family? So we have one good example. I mean, hopefully more are coming. <laughs> so one of the wife uh, got baptized, got saved and got baptized. And then his wife, his husband come and visit and just joined our Bible study. You know, he just, uh, he's a very educated man and uh, has a very good, smart thinking, ask good questions. As most of his questions are very controversial. Is that right word? Oh yeah. <laughs> so you have to very carefully to, to use the Bible scriptures to, to, you know, carefully to give to, because there's uh, so many answers outside the world, but you wanted to know, give them the truly biblical way. <laughs> so he's like, he's a, it's very interesting to see, he come to me, he said, I visit all the Chinese church in Chiang Mai, and I have something come to conclusion. You know, he said, any religions come to China, we change it for some reason. <laughs> you know? So the churches I visit, and they treat Jesus like a Santa Claus. You know, you ask, only preaching about a God's love and forgiveness, they don't talk about a, the true gospel, about a, what an American teacher teached. It's but there's a problem in this. We love American teachers, but uh, the problem is the majority of us, English is not good enough. And you went to America, got a Bible training. Do you think you can have a teaching us? You know, it sounds exciting, but uh, I know my sinful nature. <laughs> so I know I, I can, you know, I would, much I wanted to do it, but I have this uh, fear, in, you know, fear the Lord in my heart. <laughs> Stay that way. I was like, so I, said, I need to talk to my husband, you know. So then we come together, say how you start a group and that we can participate to help you to, to, to you know, help other people who will never have a question, you know. So then he did it. Then you can see this guy, he's very interesting. He, he first, one of the first questions he's like, what is biblical marriage? It's like he did all the scriptures put underneath his support. His point is biblical marriage, you know, marriage is blessed by God only God only bless marriage who are Christians. So non-Christians, God not bless them. They can divorce anytime they want. I said, no, that's not what the Bible said. So anyway, we have this long discussion. I was like, you know, go to the Genesis, talk about people's sin. He said, no, 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 I'm not talking about sin. I'm talking about marriage. I said, no, you cannot talk about marriage without talking about human sin. <laughs> so you can see his eyes open. It's like, oh, that is it. You know, he can put all the pieces together. And he's just so passionate about teaching people about like, biblical, you know, principles and biblical living. And uh, he he tried to translate it as a parenthood book. For me, you know, as a, I read it, I say I understand, but I I was never able to translate in Chinese. And he just did it. I was like, bless your heart. <laughs> so he, you can see it's just the hunger. And eventually he got baptized. And you see how he's. Uh, passion to teaching God's word. It's just so beautiful. Just to see the wife, how we reach the wife and the husband come alongside. And I just like it. Just praise the Lord. Say the beauty of it. You know, so. Okay. Yeah. We'll go to the next slide. And Okay, so that's our home Bible study. Um, again, um, I think one believer and then the rest are seekers. These are all Chinese um, parents that have come to Thailand for one reason or another. We'll go to the next slide. 
And that's Charles that Katie was talking about, and that's his baptism day. So we got to see that happen, be a part of that. So again, God, God is still using you know, things like the pandemic. Um, it, it's bringing many people to a place of searching and seeking. Uh, a lot of people have just realized, you know what? <laughs> my government doesn't have my best interests on their mind. <laughs> and, and now they're able to ask questions. Um, now, on the flip side of that, so the, the more difficult things that we're talking about, the brokenness of the families, that's, that's the daily life that we're, that we're experiencing as well. We'll go to the next slide. So we want to talk about this other aspect of our ministry that God has really opened up in the last two years specifically. So uh, Katie has received some training. Uh, it's called trauma healing uh, training. So it's for a trauma healing group. It's similar to counseling, but it's like a group therapy where you use the scripture to guide people through healing um, over traumatic experiences. So we, we've been able to do this. this. This was in our Thai church, actually. And so we're at our Thai church. We have the teacher that is teaching in English, and then it's being translated into Thai, and Katie is translating in Chinese. It's a very busy room, and there's, there's different groups, and everybody's sharing in their group. It's a very vulnerable time, and uh, you're talking about you know, experiences of your life that are just uh, you know, painful, and, and it brings healing, and it, there's like a pinnacle point at the end where you know, you you nail your sin to the cross and, and you learn about forgiveness. It's just a, it's a very uh, healing time. So um, this is Katie's group of Chinese ladies that went through this and experienced it and realized this, this is what we need. And so we just want to ask you to keep praying for us to give us wisdom. There are so many more people who need this kind of thing. Again, because of social pressures, family pressures, uh, a lot of the, the, children of the parents that are coming over are experiencing depression and uh, suicide attempts and uh, different kinds of basically anything related to, to mental health it's it's there because it's, it's a challenging time for for lots of people and so uh, not just the chinese community but our thai church experienced this as well and needed it um, it was what shortly before this right we had the yeah before we had two suicides, one in the Chinese community and one in the Thai church within the same week or the same couple of weeks happened. Same day. Same day. Same day. Yeah. Same. Different places. Um, and so anyway, this, this came at a very needy time when this was already on everybody's mind. So um, anyway, that's, that's another thing that as, as God leads, we want to follow him in that. We'll go to the next slide. Um, so, yeah, one other thing that I should discuss is, you know, another big change in our life has been the change in our sending organization. So we taught with ELIC for a very long time. Um, this is the first time I can, like, formally introduce my family as a missionary family. <laughs> we're not afraid to use that word missionary now. We, n we were never afraid of using it before. But now we can publicly broadcast and, and say we are missionaries uh, in Thailand. There is a you know, a freedom of religion, and so we can, we don't have to be as cautious and careful about how we use that term. Uh, so we're with SIM. Uh, if you have any questions about SIM, you know, we, we can talk to you later about that, but this, this organization has well over 100 years of experience. They've been in Thailand for over a decade, so uh, a lot of good experience there. I'll go to the next slide. And uh, this is kind of our motto, convinced that no one should la live or die without hearing God's good news. We believe that he's called us to make disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ in communities where he's least known. Yeah. And we'll go to the next slide. That's kind of what I want to talk about. So you remember all those opportunities that we experienced in the last couple of years. Um, you know, when you talk about the need, the need is endless, okay? If, if, if I took this whole group of church people right now to chain my Thailand, You'd all have jobs <laughs> in a matter of minutes that we could never fulfill all the needs that are out there, whether it's orphanages or teaching English or planting churches or teaching, translation, whatever. There's endless need. We can't do it all ourselves. 
And if for, whatever, if for whatever reason our church is expected the reeds to do it all, no, no thanks. <laughs> We'd be burned out. We, we can't handle all the need. Um, that being said, even if we fulfill need, but we don't proclaim the gospel, then you're missing people's truest need, their, their deepest need. So, you know, for example, the trauma healing, you're, you're dealing with somebody's physical, mental, emotional need. And you're also preaching the gospel to them, fulfilling that deeper need. So they go hand in hand. But again, with just those two, again, the reeds can't do it all. All of us in this room, we can't do it all. And that's why we need the third, the church. And so the local Thai church, that's, that's the key. As we build up the church, we're equipping more people to do the need and to preach the gospel. And so I just, I like sharing this slide as it gives a picture of, our strategy, our hope, our vision for future ministry, we need all three, and they go hand in hand. And as we equip the church, as God equips the church, we're able to proclaim the gospel and respond to the needs that are in Thailand. So I think we can fast forward to one more after that. Yeah. So, um, yeah, just a quick reminder, we've got our table there, and we'd encourage you to take a new prayer card. Um, you know, again, that's like the old-fashioned Facebook, right? Missionary prayer cards. You can fill your fridge with them. Have all the different, or football trading cards, you know? Think of it like that. I could sign it if that helps. I don't know. But um, if you don't like QR codes, we also have, you can just write your email on the list that we have there at the table. So that way you get our, our updates. So uh, real quick, you know, we've been doing a lot of brain activity right now. This would be a good time to take a question. Uh, do you guys have any questions for us, something that we didn't talk about or something that you've been dying to know. Uh, okay. All right. Yeah. yeah. All right. I should talk about the, the seminary. Yeah. The upcoming. <laughs> so for the next uh, eight years, potentially, um, I've started my PhD studies in biblical theology. And the purpose of that is so that I can, Lord willing, teach in a Thai seminary. So that's one of the opportunities. Again, Connected with our church, the Thai church that we're going to, um, we got to learn about this seminary, which is, again, is all Thai-led. It's taught in Thai, so I have to learn Thai and be able to speak fluently. Um, but that's the goal, is to train missionaries, pastors, and ministry leaders in a Thai seminary. And so that's, that's our commitment for the next eight to ten years, Lord willing, as God allows us to stay there. Um, that's that's kind of what we're looking to do. Okay, any other last-minute questions? Okay, great. All right. All right, that being said, let's pull out our Bibles then, and let's get to John chapter 9. We'll go ahead and go to the second slide. Start that. There we go. So we're going to talk about Jesus, the good shepherd. We're talking about Jesus today. And the gospel writer of John introduces us to Jesus and, and what he was doing, the purpose and the, the goal of his mission. I think many of us are familiar with John chapter 10. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd uh, knows his sheep. But I want to take a step back to John chapter 9 as we see the story that happened, which is why Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. Okay, so I've got a question for us. Uh, I think we'll go to the next slide. I think I got, oh no, that's not yet, not yet. But anyway, let me ask my question first. So question is, what is the source of your power? Meaning, what allows you to do what you do every single day? I'll, I'll give a, a quick illustration, a small story from our life that kind of scared me a little bit. We were driving from North Carolina to uh, St. Louis, Missouri. Lawn road, we were on the highway, middle of nowhere, and I realized, oh shoot, I didn't fill up on gas. It's almost empty. I need to stop at the next gas station. There's just one. Stopped at the gas station. This was the same day that that weird little global outage happened, right? You remember that? And... Um, 
all over the gas station said, cash only, no credit cards. Now, I've been living in Asia for years. I do all of my banking on my phone. I don't carry cash with me. I, I just do all my stuff on phone. In America, you know, credit card, that's my go-to. And I've never been more, I guess, ashamed, like, oh, yeah, I kind of forgot, cash exists. And now I need it. Like, if I don't have it, I'm toast. We need gas. And it was just kind of a snapshot of, of uh, okay, what if, you know, all your money systems stopped working? <laughs> what would you do? What would you depend on? And uh, praise God, somebody had put some cash in our pocket like the day before when we were getting ready to leave. And I was like, oh, I was able to get gas. But it, it gave me a little scare and a little reminder. You know, what if the thing that you use every single day just disappeared in one day, right? Where would your power come from? Who would you turn to? Family, friends? Um, go ahead and go to the next picture. Uh, this, as you know, Thailand is a Buddhist country. And you're going to see hundreds and thousands of these temples. There's temples everywhere. They're kind of like McDonald's or Dollar General here. They're on every corner. Okay, so there's, there's temples everywhere. And in this special temple, it's really unique. I want you to notice here these, these cords that are just going from place to place. That's not normal. That's not a normal thing. So there's something special going on there. What is that? You've got the beautiful temple. It's very gorgeous. You know, the, the monks live there. They worship there. People come and visit. A lot of tourists do too. But what's going on with all these cords? So this is all over the temple complex. And it was explained to me, you can see there's different thicknesses to the cords too. There's like thin strings and then there's really big ropes. And this represents the spiritual power of the prayers of the Buddhist monks. So there's certain areas of the temple that receive more prayer, and so there's more power. So the, the closer you are to that area, the more blessing you'll get. And it, I just, whoa, what a vivid picture of the actual belief in power. Now, I want to translate this to, uh, to our world, okay? here in Wisconsin, in America, right? It's on a flip side, on a positive note, right? It's a hobby of mine to go to little towns, especially small towns, and just wonder what makes this town tick, right? Like it could be a paper mill, or it could be a manufacturing plant or a big farm. And you just wonder if that was taken away, what would be left of this community, right? Like you can go to Green Bay, Wisconsin, I just, just imagine you're a foreigner there. You've never been. And you go to Green Bay, Wisconsin, and you're like, what's this big gold G going on? Like, it's on my clothes, and it's on my gas, and it's on my food. Like, what makes this town tick? And then you think to yourself, if that entire organization just disappeared in one day, what would be left of the town? <laughs> it makes you think. <laughs> Our communities are glued together, sometimes by invisible powers and they distribute blessing and benefit to the people, and they keep things running. And I want to transfer us into this uh, passage, John chapter 9. We are right in the middle of this very powerful community. This is Jerusalem. This is the temple. Okay, People have co been coming to this temple for hundreds of years, assuming we are God's people and we have power because this temple is standing. Right? And so uh, Jesus comes at a time when there's a festival. And uh, this is a really important festival. It's called the Feast of Tabernacles. You know, the Jewish holiday has some really serious, somber, religious holidays. The Feast of Tabernacles is more like a celebration kind of a thing. Think fall festival or, you know, state fair, something like that. People are out in tents and there's food and there's grilling and there's, it, it's more of a celebration. So it's a really happy festival. And look in John chapter 9, verse 1. It says, he passed by. So he's walking at the end of this festival in the middle of Jerusalem, the most important, religiously important community of the world. And he saw a blind man from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, uh, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents. But you know what? 
that the works of God might be displayed in him, we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. So Jesus says, let's not waste this opportunity. Let's, uh, let's help this man because Jesus has something that he wants to do, not just for this man, but for the whole community. The entire community of Jerusalem had missed this blind man and they needed to be shown, they needed to have their eyes opened to something that Jesus knew and the people were ignorant of. So, having said these things, verse 6, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Now, uh, you've got to understand, again, what was the power system of this day, of this community in Jerusalem? The Pharisees were the religious rulers. And if you wanted to buy or sell, if you wanted to get married someday, if you wanted to have a good job, right, it all depended on what the Pharisees said and what the synagogue said. And we're going to see later when this blind man's parents are threatened that they might be kicked out of the synagogue, they get scared. And now you can understand why. If you get kicked out of synagogue, no job. No career, no nothing, no family to help, no blessing, no benefit from the powers that be. So this, this is a serious deal. And Jesus comes to this community and he finds this blind man. Um, again, you know, <laughs> during one of the happiest times of the season, Jesus kind of just notices, oh, hey, what about this guy? What about this poor, unfortunate person? And, you know, Jerusalem was kind of like, oh, let's... Why do you got to dig up the dirt in our life? Why, why, why do you got to go there? So Jesus heals this man. He spits on the ground. He makes mud with the saliva. He anoints the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam. Now, no detail is wasted with Jesus. He does this on purpose. I want you to understand why. Why did he spit on the ground and make mud? There's one very simple reason. He was purposely trying to aggravate the Pharisees and succeeding at it because there this was sabbath day and their interpretation of the law said no work no making stuff at all so making mud was work and it broke their laws again their laws not moses's not god's law their laws and so jesus purposely does this why he's on a mission he's on a mission now, I keep saying that. He, he's got a purpose. He's got a mission. And that, that's what I want to go to. Um, yeah, let's go to the, should be the fourth slide. Yeah, right here. John 3. If you back up in John 3, uh, let's, let's read that. And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds become evil exposed. I believe this is the purpose statement for why Jesus is in the streets of Jerusalem day after festival, why he's wandering through the streets. I believe this is why. He's come to expose the deeds of darkness. This community is blind. They're blind to the powers that be. And Jesus finds this blind man and says, I'm going to help this whole community. I'm going to expose the evil deeds of men. We'll go to the next slide. How do we know that these men, that these Pharisees, that their deeds were evil? Um, again, Jesus finds this man after the, after the festival. Exodus 23, if you go back there, you can see the Pharisees got the law wrong. That's, that's why Jesus made the mud, to show you guys are missing the point of why the law was given to you. And he goes back here. Um, if you were truly following the law, there wouldn't be a blind man begging on the streets on the Sabbath. You see the connection there? If you were really following the law, this blind man wouldn't be begging on the streets because the law t told you how to take care of poor people. It told you how to take care of the beggars and the outsiders and the helpless. So here's these religious Pharisees so prideful in their ability to obey all these little laws, 
but they completely miss the point. And Jesus finds this blind man and says, what about this one? You missed it. You're not doing it. And so here's the, the message that John 9 is, is giving us and is sinking into the blind man is, I don't think my community has been caring for me. Think of it. His whole life, he has been depending on this community, the city of Jerusalem, and these people, his neighbors. You can see when he's healed, his neighbors are pretty excited. Um, verse 10, they ask him, oh, how were your eyes opened? And he answered, the man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? I don't know. Interesting. Jesus is nowhere to be found. So the, the neighbors, they brought to, to the Pharisees the man who had been formerly blind. Now it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Now notice this. The man, the blind man, we're going to focus our attention on him. He's the main character in this story now. Um, so he's brought to the Pharisees. What, what do you think this blind man is thinking? Or formerly, formerly blind man. So the Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, now notice the detail that he left out. He put mud on my eyes and I washed and I see. What detail did he leave out? Jesus made the mud. That Jesus made the mud. Why did he leave that out? I think this man is already starting to distrust his leaders. He's already realizing, wait a minute, these guys aren't for me. They don't really want to know what. And you can see the Pharisees ask over and over, how, how, how did he heal you? How did you get healed? Here's this man. He's been blind his whole life since birth. And he finally finds his freedom. I mean, he can get a job now. He had to beg before. Now he can get a job. Now he can. Is his family happy for him? Is his community happy for him? No, they just want to know, how did he heal you? We want to know so we can make a conviction. And you can see the man is starting to realize this. So you can see this, this scale. As his trust in Jesus grows, his trust in the Pharisees starts to shrink. And the more you, you can see it, look at verse um, 11. He said, Jesus the man. In verse 17, skip ahead. The blind man said, Jesus, the prophet. In verse 25, he says, I see. In verse 31, he calls him a worshiper of God. And in verse 38, he calls him Lord. So you can just see this progressing. His eyes are getting more open, right? He's, he was blind. Now he can see physically. But his spiritual eyes are opening over time. Just as his trust in these Pharisees, as he's realizing, wait a minute, these people are not for me. They've, they've, been, uh, they've been not caring for me as, as God had intended them to. Um, so I, I want to share a story from our life, from our ministry uh, in, in Thailand as well. So we saw this very same thing happen with our friend. Um, her name is Hannah. My wife met her by chance, really. Well, by God's chance. So she was shopping for a bike and saw online this lady was selling her bike. And so my wife went to her door and met and then, oh no, I, she didn't have money. So she had to come back the next day. So she came back the next day and the lady just invited her into her house right away. And uh, really quickly started sharing her story in tears and just opened up. And Katie realized oh, this, this is not usual, this is not normal. So we found out uh, this lady, Hannah, she had, she had grown up um, really vulnerable and uh, abused and manipulated uh, by her husband. So she had no family of her own to protect her or to be accountable to, and only her husband, who had physically, um, emotionally, and uh, financially abused her, manipulated her. So it was really a miracle uh, when, when COVID happened and they closed the border and such, somehow she was able to get to Thailand and her husband was not. His, his passport had expired or something and so he couldn't, he couldn't. So she got to Thailand and she brought her two daughters for education. And so this distance at least gave her some time to 
uh, go to church and explore and make friends. But again, a very lonely and vulnerable woman. She had actually gone to several churches, a couple of which were cults. And so the Jehovah Witness got a hold of her. And then, and then as we taught her the Bible, she realized, oh, yeah, there, that, that's not good either. And so she went to another cult and, and, and bounced around a little bit, finally finding a, a church that could help her and help her with her healing. Uh, she had been to counselors that, and pastors that told her that all of her problems were her fault. And so she just, she just really was shamed and had that shame heaped up on her. No one had believed her. Uh, finally, one day she came to her house crying and she realized her husband had poisoned her food, uh, trying to just put her away uh, once and for all. Uh, all her life, she had been told by him that she was crazy and insane. So at that point, uh, we were able to take her to the police station and the hospital. And uh, for the first time in her life, she heard somebody that actually believed her. And it was the translator. It wasn't even the doctor or the police officer. It was the translator that got down on her knees and looked at her in the eyes and said, you go home and take care of your kids and take care of yourself. You are important. And she just broke down crying. Was, you know, her experience in China had been if she went to the police, they would just believe her husband and just call her insane and shut the door on her. So that had been her experience her whole life. And you could see all it took was sharing truth with her. Very simple truth. No, you need to take care of yourself, and this is a healthy thing to do. And just to see the lights come on. And as she realized, oh my goodness, my whole life I've been under this oppression. And there is a way out. There is healing. There's, there's restoration. And so... Somewhere, Hannah got her confidence, and when her husband called her and she said, hey, I've been to the hospital today, and the doctor's going to test the food, and he got scared, <laughs> and he fled, and he went back to China. And so, praise God, she was in a safe place finally. Um, why did he get so scared? Well, because she spoke truth. She found truth, and that gave her this unfound, never had before confidence that you could just see. And I want you, again, to put yourself back in John chapter 9, the experience of this blind man. He's grown up completely dependent on these people and his neighbors. His community has not been taking care of him. Now he's found happiness, healing, a friend. He can see. And what's the first thing that he sees? We'll go to the next slide. This is his community. These are his neighbors. This is the welcome he gets after he found healing. The Pharisees made very plain what they're after. In a, in a later chapter, in chapter 11, they said, if we let Jesus alone like this, everyone's going to believe in him. The Romans are going to come, and they're going to take both our place and our nation. So you find out exactly why the Pharisees treated him this way. They were afraid of losing their power. They were afraid of losing their power. And so Jesus' message to not just this blind man. Again, why did he heal the blind man? Was it because he only felt sorry for the blind man? He's got a much bigger mission, mission going on here. He's opening the eyes of not just one man, the entire community. Your community is not for you. It's inadequate. It's not shepherding you. Hence, John chapter 10. I am the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd that will find you. And so this, this story ends a little strangely to us. It, it's not the happy ending that we expect in, in verse, uh, I think it's 35. Yep. They, Jesus, oh no, I skipped ahead. Verse 34. They answered him. So the Pharisees answered this blind man, you were born in utter sin. Would you teach us? And they cast him out. So his parents' worst fears were realized. They were trying to avoid this. They didn't want to get kicked out of synagogue. And now the day has come. They've been kicked out of synagogue. He got kicked out. And, and we think, well, that's not a happy ending. Well, Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And having found him, so Jesus came and found him. This is how the story ends. Where has Jesus been all this time? 
He healed the man and then he disappeared. And it's just amazing that he lets this blind man just kind of take over and reveal to the whole city, these people are not for you. <laughs> and, and there is a better shepherd than, than these ones. And then Jesus shows up at the end. And, you know, uh, my, my application to that as, as missionaries, sometimes we get tempted to think, I need to go change the world. I need to go tell everyone how bad Buddhism is and how great Jesus is. And, you know, sometimes like this, Jesus just says, let, let the work do, its, you know, do itself. Let, let God's word just open people's eyes. And as, as missionaries, we can't. We can't open people's eyes. Only God can do that. Um, but we are there to expose the deeds of, of inadequate communities, just, just like Jesus did here, just like the, the formerly blind man did. So, um, again, it, it ends a little strange, but that's, that's the point of this message is that Jesus finds him at the end and says, I am enough community for you. So he just lost his synagogue, his family, his town, his community, but he gained Jesus, and that's enough. And Jesus says, I will be the community for you. The good shepherd, that's what John 10 is all about, the good shepherd. So the good shepherd's going to find you, he's going to rescue you, he's going to pick you up, and look, even if your family and friends and parents forsook you, Jesus the Good Shepherd's going to come to you and he's going to be enough community for your life. So I want to wrap up with some application here. Um, number one, community is important, but it's fallen. Uh, the, the message of John 9 is not go be a hermit and leave all your communities, okay? <laughs> We're Americans, we're Manitowacans, if that's what you, how you say it. I don't know. We're, we're part of communities. We're part of Calvary Chapel. You're part of a family. You're part of an extended family. You're part of a government, a citizen. You're part of, I don't know, a bingo club on a Saturday. You know. We all have different communities that we're part of. We're not supposed to run away from them all. But I think the message is clear. None of them are adequate to shepherd our soul. Uh, only God's community can do that. Uh, it's not the economy. It's not your career. It's not media or uh, influencers. That, that is quickly becoming the, you know, the, the main way that people are influenced by what they see on TikTok and Instagram. Uh, it's not fame or self-worth or acceptance. Jesus came to expose the evil deeds of those men to show that they are not shepherding you, but I will be your shepherd. Okay, so number two, Jesus will come to you, as we said. And number three, I, j I just want to remind us, you know, usually when we preach a sermon and we show the Pharisees, we, we make this application. I, I don't want to be a Pharisee, right? <laughs> we certainly don't want to be that way. And I'll, I'll give you an, an illustration, again, from our life in, in Thailand. We, we talked to you about our church and how we as a family were warmly accepted into that church. People loved on us. They loved on our kids. They just... It, it fit. And the preaching is great. Uh, and you know, just a lot of good reasons that we chose and went to that church. So there is a lady who is a seeker, not yet a believer, but very interested, looking, searching for truth. And uh, we invited her, or no, sorry, I back up. She asked us, she said, well, I want to do things right. I want to follow the Bible. I should go to a church. Where do you go? And we said, oh, well, we go to this church. Would you like to join? And so, again, I, I want you to picture a church can be a happy and healthy, welcoming place. But she met the 1% of the church that she got the total opposite reaction. And she was accused and slandered and stonewalled. And just, it, it's a fact of life, right? No two people have the exact same experience in the same room that other people have. And this can be a gospel preaching, happy place that welcomes people. And yet one person might come and go back to those Pharisees. That's the experience that they get. And let me draw this closer home. You know, you've seen my kids are older. This parenthood thing is getting real, folks. I mean, we're getting up there. This is the scary stage, right? Um, our families are the same. God designed the family. God gave us families to minister to us, right? 
That, that's how God works in this world. And yet, our family, you know, we, we can do righteous, holy things on Sunday morning and really act the part and then go home and be like the Pharisees to our family, right? The, these people here could experience Tim Reed in a great way and say, what a, what a kind person. And then my kids could go home and experience a totally different side. And, and that's just reality that any one of us are capable of being that, that pharisaical uh, community, right? So I, I just want to invite us. We want to make our homes uh, um, not just welcoming, but um, really places of honesty and where, where God's truth is proclaimed. We want to uncover the, the deeds of darkness, just as Jesus did. And then lastly, I just, I want to, well, before we get to the last one, I, one more application. Um, the greatest Pharisee that I know is not somebody who's offended me or made my life difficult. It's actually me. So when I think of all the, the bad shepherds that I've had in my life, right? Maybe I've had a really aggravating boss before. Okay, I, I worked in healthcare too, so I, <laughs> I, I know stress, stressful bosses. Um, we had a psychotic landlord. I think we told you about that story in China before. We, we, we've had people that have mistreated us before. But you know, the person who has mistreated me the most is me. The person who has done the worst job at shepherding my life has been me. And so just like this blind man, I need to be made blind so that I can have my eyes open and realize Tim Reed is not the best shepherd. I need Jesus, the good shepherd. And we might need that too. May Jesus come and open our eyes and make us realize our shepherds have not been doing a good job and I am not the best manager for my own life. I need Christ. Um, in, in, in Thailand, there is a news article about, so going back to the, the Buddhist communities, you know, we'll have the monks come to our, our little, uh, what do you call it, Muban is the Thai word, our, our little uh, community, our gated community. And the monks will come and receive the food and give the blessings. We see that every single morning. There was a news article about a small town, a small village. They could only afford one temple, so you can see how small it was. And uh, there were three monks for that whole village, and all three of them were arrested in one day uh, because they were doing meth. And so the whole place got busted, and you know they're all in jail. And I'm just thinking, okay, from a religious standpoint, it's easy for us as North American Christians to be like, don't they see it? Don't they see through the facade of religion? Like... They're not for you, okay? <laughs> they are not there to bless and benefit you. But from a community standpoint, my heart breaks. I'm like, what are they going to do? You know, how long it takes to raise up another monk? And now they've got nobody. And we would think it's just so easy to realize this is not for me. This religion is not for me. Why don't I find the, the true shepherd? But we're, we're the same way with our family or upbringing or politics or, you know, whatever the God of this world uh, is for us. Uh, may God help us to uncover the deeds of darkness so that his light can come. And so how does the story end? Jesus tells the Pharisees, I wish you would be blind. I think he's talking about physical blindness. I wish you would become physically blind like this poor beggar did, because then maybe you could see the light. And so maybe we can end by praying, God, as difficult as this may be, whatever the blindness is that I need so that I can see your true light, or what will it take for Thai people to realize that their religion is not for them? What will it take for um, a mother who's been mistreated all her life to realize this person's not for me, I, I need Jesus? Let's pray for blindness for that person so that they can see the true light. God, we want to take your yoke upon you, because, uh, upon us, because your burden is light. Uh, being a slave to you is way more freeing than being a servant to anything else in this world. Uh, help us be families of hope and healing and uh, honesty and openness, not places where people get um, sidelined or, or stonewalled or, or shut down or shamed because of their sin. Uh, help us to be healing as you were healing. 
God, you are the good shepherd, and we just ask that uh, today in, in our community here and in Thailand, in Chiang Mai, you would lift the scales. You would uh, open people's eyes to see Jesus and nothing else. In your name we pray. Amen.